we have been talking about generation of surfaces right primarily the parametric surfaces so uh, last time we talked about the bezier surfaces right so as an example here what you see is a bicubic patch so here you have a parametric domain defined through parameters u and v right in a rectilinear domain these are the control points for the bezier patch right and this is the surface you obtain right so bicubic uh, patch because it is cubic in both u and v and in fact the uh, construction method we looked at there was one using de castle algorithm right, where you could do a repetitive bilinear interpolation to obtain the point on the surface or you could also do a tensor product of the bernstein polynomials in u and v to obtain the the surface right so uh, the advantage of the tensor product is that you don't have to deal sp special cases where the degree in u and degree in v are different right it's there in the formulation itself okay so and it gives you all kinds of properties similar to curves right so affine invariance convex hull right and the shape of the surface which you obtain is basically governed by the location or position of these control points right so it interpolates the corner control points it also interpolates the boundary curves which means that if i have to construct a bezier curve using only these four points right so the curve which i get is the boundary curve for the surface right so for the change in the shape we have very similar situation as in the case of curves we move let's say a control point right displace a control point the surface which is embedded using these control points also moves right and once again the bezier surfaces do not give you local control right so the entire surface kind of moves and there is a local control in a pseudo sense depending on the influence of the parameter with respect to the point which is moved right so so that gives you a mechanism of shape control right now we also looked at uh, we also looked at the property like uh, degree elevation just the way we could elevate the degree in curves we could also elevate the degree of the surface right in any one of the parameters in u or in v or in both and we also then uh, looked at the derivatives right so the derivatives can actually be computed in a similar way as we do it for curves so in the tensor product formulation the advantage is that you can always decompose your problem into a univariate case just the way you will handle then the curves right so you can extend those ideas to the bivariate case which is defined as a tensor product right so here if i am looking at the partial derivative with respect to u all i need to do is 
take this inside and now this is very similar to as if I was doing the derivative of curves right using the parameter u. So, what it gives me an operator which I call it as delta 1 0 right 1 here because I am basically considering the derivative with respect to the parameter u 0 there is no change in v right and this operator when applied on b i j is nothing but the span of the polygon right this is nothing but span of the polygon b i plus 1 j minus b i j right. something similar to what we observed in curves right. So, similarly we can talk about partial derivative with respect to v there the operator is now delta 0 1 right. So, I will be changing the indices j right. So, b i j plus 1 minus b i j right. So, uh, then I can see the cross boundary derivatives right which are basically defined by the the pair in the span of the polygon right. So, for instance if I am looking for the derivative here all I have to do is take this kind of a st strip which is defined by the adjacent pair of the Bezier control points which would give me the derivative right. Just the way we had seen the derivative in the case of curves were also Bezier curves right of a reduced degree. Similarly, we also observe that the surface derivative is also a Bezier surface. Okay, so, and the uh, the relevance of derivative is when we want to construct composite patches, right? Then we need to worry about the match of the derivatives, right? So last time uh, you were give, given a small exercise that, given the partial derivatives at a point how do you compute normal at the surface right. So, the answer is that you just take a cross product right because you basically have two tangent right which would span a plane there and then you can obtain the normal vector just taking as the cross product of these two tangents right. So, if I am saying that this is the partial with respect to u and this is the partial derivative with respect to v. So, I am just taking a cross product of these two vectors to give me the normal at this point right. It is very simple thing and well you could normalize it to get the normalized normal vector fine. So, this is important because eventually you need to render these surfaces right. So, uh, while let us say we are talking about rendering how do you propose rendering of a Bezier surface let us say how would you render a Bezier curve. Yes. R rendering its control points. No, eventually you have to render the curve, right? So that means the point on the curve. Once we get the equation of the curve. Yeah. We vary the parameter. And yeah. So one possibility is that you change the parameter t, right? Compute the point on the curve, 
and join it with the previously computed point with a simple line, small line, right? Eventually, it has to be a some sort of a continuous curve, right? That's one way to do it, right? The computation of the point on the curve by varying the parameter t, right? And just join it by let's say some line segment. So you are in some sense approximating certain points in in between, right? Through line. Is there an alternative way? What interpolant? The Casper algorithm. See that gives you a point. <coughs> on the curve that is a that is a construction. So, that you can get either using de Casper algorithm or Bernstein polynomial right. We have also talked about subdivision of curve remember what was that see I can start with the with the control points or the control polygon of the curve and keep subdividing what happens? In the limiting case, I approach the curve, right. So, therefore, I can use that as a mechanism to even plot the curve, right. Starting from the Bezier polygon, I can keep subdividing the polygon right and under a certain threshold I stop the subdivision and that becomes in the display of the curve right. Similarly, I can also do for surfaces. So, both ways I could either change the parameter u and v right and then obtain small quads considering that those to be polygonal right or I could start from the control net of the Bezier surface and keep doing the subdivision right. So, that is a method by which I can display the surface right ok. So, uh, again uh, looking at these derivative terms there is a an additional uh, derivative which could be also of interest in certain situations. So, what, what had we done so far? We basically took a partial derivative in u or then partial derivative in v and there was a physical interpretation of those partials in terms of the tangent vectors at the point right. And we could also get mixed partials right partial in u and then partial in v right. And just by the way we had done earlier, there will be an operator, let us say delta 1 1, right, which would say that there is a difference in u and then there is also a difference in v, right. So, what this uh, mixed partial is doing, the, the let us say the geometric interpretation of that is. Let us say I am talking about these four control points of the Bezier polygon, right? B i j, B i plus 1 j, B i j plus 1 and B i plus 1 and j plus 1, right? Now, if I look at this operator delta 1 1, what is it doing? It is basically performing the differences in u and v right right so this delta 1 1 is nothing but taking a difference of b i plus 1 j plus 1 minus b i plus 1 j right and a difference for the i now b i j plus 1 minus b i j and then the difference of these two right that is what de delta 1 1 would do just an expansion of the differences. Now, let us say I construct a point T i j 
this point p i j in the manner that p i j minus b i plus 1 j this is the same as b i j plus 1 minus b i j which is this right. So, I basically construct p i j as a point which would construct a parallelogram using these three points right. Then I can basically show that this delta 1 1 operator is nothing but this offset ok. So, that is sort of easy to see. So, once I have see I have seen the the operator delta 1 1 right then this is nothing but b i plus 1 j plus 1 minus p i j right. So, so some of the, the, the you make a substitution from here to this expression and that is what you will get fine. So, what is being interpreted here is that this is sort of a deviation from the plane which is spanned between these three points. So, had this been 0 this this would have been a planar thing all these four points would have actually given you a plane right. So, it is a deviation from that plane. So, sometimes it is called as a twist vector. So, uh, I am not going to actually talk uh, the application of this uh, here, maybe when you do a second course we will talk about that, but I will just try to actually give you some motivation. Uh, if you recall, if you recall the uh, cubic splines right the interpolating cubic splines. What did we have? We had a point P 1 is tangent vector at P 1, point P 2 and a tangent vector at P 2 let us say P 2 prime right. So, given this right given this using cubic splines you obtain a curve like this right. And the expression what we get is so the the, the curve which I, let us say I get as p t is basically expressed in this manner where f is some sort of a blending function right. So, which may look like f 1 u, f 2 u, f 3 u, f 4 u right and this g was the geometric information in terms of the position of the point p 1 position of the point p 2 and the tangent vectors p 1 prime and p 2 prime right. So, that is what you had here right. So, this was your cubic interpolating spline and we this is also called as Hermit spline right. So, the idea is that you have a matrix formulation where you are basically blending a geometric information right. Now, let us say I try to extend the similar idea to construct a surface where I would be given some boundary conditions right. That is I am saying that I have let us say information about 
the position right. So, what I am trying to do I am basically trying to look at a bicubic surface right the interpolating spline was a cubic spline right bicubic surface which would satisfy certain boundary condition and just by extending the matrix formulation of cubic spline I can see a surface let us say x u v which could be written in some sense these f's some g right and then again f t. So, this could be let us say for u and this could be for v right. So, that would match with my matrix formulation or something also like a tensor product right. In a Bezier formulation I have the f given as the Bernstein polynomials, Bernstein polynomial in u, Bernstein polynomial in v and the geometric information is the control points right that is how it looks. Now, in this case so what do I have is right like this right. So, so here I can have some 16 things right in in order to satisfy this matrix multiplication formulation right. So, there are some 16 things right. So, let us try to see if we extend the idea of cubic splines the information which could determine these 16 things right. So, 4 of which are the positions that is a 4 corner points right. I can also have the the tangent vectors or the derivatives just the way I had in splines cubic spline right. Fine that makes 12. If I have this mixed mixed partials which are the twist vectors right see then I have 16 things right. So, I can construct a hermit bicubic surface right where these these f's are very similar to the case in the curves right and I may have the information of let us say the the position right here. So, here I could have some matrix of position, here I could have some matrix of tangent vectors in u, here I could have some matrix of tangent vectors in v and here I could have some matrix of partial u and v or the twist vector. right. So, given this geometric information I can then construct the bicubic hermit surface. Right. So, that is let us say some relevance or application of twist vector there are some other also, but this is one which you can extend it from the curves right. Okay, so, if we uh, go back here now, so one of the motivation of getting these derivative is to be able to construct composite surfaces just the way we did composite curves right. So, let us say a situation is here I have a patch uh, O and then another patch 
R, all I want is to have a composite patch which joins these two, right. So, once again there could be various ways in which we can look at the joining of the two patches. So, for instance, we can have a composite patch where all we are concerned is that the end points should match, right. That is, we have a C naught continuous surface. So, which is given through if I have these control points for the first patch the same as the first control points for the second patch, right. As long as they are at the same position, I will have the two patches meeting at this at this curve, right, which is the boundary curve for the two patches, just because the boundary control points are the same, right. So, that is a C naught continuous patch. What happens if I am interested in C 1? So, then there the role of derivatives comes, right. So, what do you suggest? How should it be? Yeah, so derivative should same should be the same. That is what we are saying. So geometrically, what it what it uh, boils down to. In the case of curves, what happens? Pardon me. Yeah, smooth in the curve. That's what our intention is, right? Uh, what I'm saying is, with respect to the control polygon. Let's say if I had taken the case of a curve. If I take a curve and another curve, and I want them to be C1 continuous what is the constraint I need in terms of the position of the control points for the two curves? They should lie in the same line. They should lie in the same line. So, they are collinearity, right. They should be collinear because we are talking about the, these curves and then these spans should also be the same, right. Right. Basically, we are saying that B, let us say if I am talking about cubic, then B 3 minus B 2 in the first curve 3 times, right. So, the, the other side will also be 3 times B 1 minus B 0 for the second curve, right. So, these spans should be the same, right. As long as I am having the parametric domain definitions between 0 and 1. If I change them of course, then I have to take the ratios, right. So, that is what will happen in even the, in the case of surfaces. So, if in order to have a C 1 continuous surface for the two patches here, I need that this and this they are they form a line right. So, these are collinear, these are also collinear and so on right. So, that is the the configuration of control points right to give me C 1 continuous curve at the boundary, C 1 continuous surface at the boundary. Fine. Okay. So now that we have, uh, yeah, let me uh, give you an illustration of uh, the application of these Bezier patches. So this is actually a very famous object in the computer graphics community. Right? It's like uh, the image of Lina in image processing. Everybody wants to work with you know image of Lena, whatever operations you want to perform in image processing. So this is the 
this has a similar uh, analogy. So, whatever you do in rendering, in uh, modeling, you try to use this T part. Okay, so this is a very old historical uh, object and model of T part, which had 32 bicubic Bezier patches. Okay, let me see if I can uh, show you the. these patches here some of them. So, what you see is see these are the various patches. So, the shaded one is one single bicubic patch here corresponding to that you have this surface right. So, you have patches for the handle patches for the top patches for this right and also there are patches for the base ok. So, the nice thing about this model is that you obtain a fairly smooth kind of a surface which you see in reality right. So, the, the inspiration is coming from a real T part. So, so this is sort of a an example of the Bezier surfaces and the patches, right. So, now that we have seen the construction of Bezier surfaces using control points and some sort of a blending of these using appropriate polynomials, Bernstein polynomials. We can actually do construction of other surfaces, right, where the basis could be different than Bernstein polynomials, right. So, for instance, I can also construct B spline surfaces. That is the also the advantage of the tensor product formulation. All I need to do is use the appropriate basis function in the parameters defined through the parameter domain let us say u and v and just take the tensor product of them right. So, if you if we go back and see how a B spline was defined, B spline was defined basically through these control points and these basis functions right. So, now uh, what I will do is I will have this the control points in a similar manner as for Bezier surface and use these basis functions and take a tensor product right. So, that is what will happen right. So, you have a basis function let us say n i p in u and and j q in v. So, here this p and q would actually determine the degree of the surface in u and v just the way k was determining the degree of the curve which you were trying to construct in v spline here p and q would determine the degree of the surface you want to construct right. So, so, once again uh, a surface could be possibly generated using these control points and the basis functions and again you have the role of not vectors in terms of defining these basis functions right. So, you could possibly have open not vectors, uniform not vectors, non uniform not vectors right. So, just the way uh, we were constructing the B spline curves and had various control handles for the shape of the curve, those would be carry forwarded for the surface construction right. 
and we also have the properties also extended in a similar way. So, you have the property of affine invariance, you also have the property of convex hull which is stronger as in the case of curves right and there is also a local control right just the way we had local control in the case of B spline curves. So, that again gets extended to the surfaces right. So, just to give you an example here. So, let us say there is this B spline surface right and a point here is moved to this location. So, this is how the surface changes. So, you can see that only a small neighborhood with respect to the po point which is moved the surface has changed right. So, this local control is there fine and uh, as I said you have uh, various ways of knot vectors right. So, you may have open uniform knot vector which gives you the property of clamping to the end control points right just the way the B spline curve would pass from the the end control points if you are using the open uniform knot vector that is the repetition k times at the two end right or you could also have a closed surface just by taking the control points in a circular way so that they form a close B spline polygon or you could also have the knot vectors which are periodic right which would not guarantee that the surface passes through the end control points right. Fine. So, similar properties and ideas which are used in the case of curves can be seen in surfaces. Right? Okay. So, uh, now as we were discussing about the rendering or the display of surfaces, right? And uh, one of the ways we said that we compute the point on the surface of the curve and approximate by let us say joining a line from the previous point computed right and in the case of curve in the case of surface we could possibly compute quartz quartz means four points which could which could lie in a plane. So, I just have to display that quad which is a planar primitive right. So, in some sense what I am trying to do is I am trying to approximate the surface which is computed right into some discrete elements right which are piecewise linear, piecewise linear in the case of curves right uh, in the case of surfaces they are piecewise planar patches right. So, uh, often it is the situation that we have the representation of surfaces as these parametric surfaces right, but for the purpose of displaying we come down to these planar patches right, reduce these surfaces to collection of piecewise planar patches for various reasons. One of the reason is that the rendering which is supported in most of the let us say graphics library and the hardware we have supports polygonal shading and polygonal rendering right. So, let us try to see uh, how these polygonal representations could be done right for the purpose of converting these surfaces or even acquiring the models in terms of polygons. Right. So, so what are we trying to say is 
that let us say you have an object which is a cylindrical object right. So, one could conceive this to be made of several surfaces. So, there could be this surface which is the side surface of the cylinder and there are caps of the cylinder that could be another surface right. Now, in order that I uh, let us say display them as polygonal patches or polygonal uh, discrete elements, I would convert them into some collection of polygons right. So, this, this could be one possible decomposition into polygons right. So, collection of these polygons basically is some sort of a mesh which is generated using these polygons right. So, the idea here is that you have let us say representation which could be continuous mathematically continuous right, but at the end you have this representation right, which may be desired for several reasons and one of the reasons as I mentioned could be just the rendering right. So, now let us try to see the data structure which could be possibly be used for representing these polygonal meshes right. So, one of the let us say simpler thing is so what we are saying is that this polygonal mesh if we want to look at is nothing but a collection of edges vertices and faces or the polygons right. These are the three sort of entities which are involved in the representation of polygonal mesh right and we are considering these meshes of the kind where we see that the edge is shared by at most two polygons. So, if you look at the edge, it connects to two vertices and a polygon is nothing but it is a closed sequence of edges right. So, as a as a representation there could possibly be several ways which in which we can represent this polygonal mesh. One way is that I consider each polygon represented in an explicit fashion giving all the points which are defining that polygon right. So, I have uh, these vertices defined through its coordinates x 1, y 1, z 1, x 2, y 2, z 2 and so on x n y n z n and also the last one which would connect x n y n z n to x 1 y 1 z 1 and just to complete the loop right. So, that way I would define the edges which are there fine. Now, if you if you look at this representation so, what, what are we saying? We are saying that each polygon is defined in this fashion right. So, clearly there are lots of duplication right. Many of the vertices are repetitively used right. So, this may not be a very good way of representing the polygonal mesh plus it is very restrictive in terms of manipulation of the information in the polygonal mesh right because it does not capture information about adjacency it does not capture information about the incidence vertices to to an edge and so on and so forth right. So, the manipulation is difficult right. So, we we go uh, one step more and try to see a data structure which reduces this replication and add some 
features of manipulation right so what you could have possible possibly is a pointer to a vertex list right so instead of defining this polygonal in an explicit manner where you consider each of the vertex coordinates what you can think of is that there is a vertex list or a table of vertices which consists of the coordinates of the points right and the polygons are nothing but the index or the entry pointers to this table of the vertices that's a typical representation you might have seen right so in this example for instance if i have p1 defined using v1 v2 v4 right so these are nothing but the indices 1 2 4 in the vertex list right so this reduces the redundancy which we had in the earlier representation to a certain extent right now again uh, the from the manipulation point of view if i am interested in finding out polygons that share an edge right so with respect to let's say this edge i want to find out the polygons shared by this edge it's not easy right this data structure doesn't really facilitate that so easily right so maybe we have to do something else maybe we have to bring in information about edges right which is which is sort of missing here right so what we do is let's say we have a pointer to edge list so we we build an edge list right so so here let's say an edge is nothing but a tuple using the vertices it joins let's say vi vj and the polygons which are shared by this edge right and we also have the information of the polygon defined in terms of the edges right so here again we are considering triangular polygonal mesh that's why there are only three edges right so so in this example for instance i have the vertex list given as v1 v2 v3 v4 right these are the points i have then e1 could be defined in terms of the vertices vertices v1 and v2 right which is this and the polygons which are shared for this edge so you have p1 and there is no other polygon here so i just put null here fine similarly i can have e2 e3 and so on so e4 you observe that there is a polygon p p2 so you have both these polygons p1 and p2 for this edge right so a query for getting the polygons shared by an edge is straightforward right now the question is that if i let's say i'm interested in finding out the edges which are incident on a vertex edges which are incident on a vertex so i may have to actually go through the entire list of edges and right that may not be straight forward right so clearly as we demand more manipulation the data structure would get become heavier right so you need to store more information right so one of the data structures which is quite popular 
maybe you have heard about it is the winged edge data structure have you heard about it no ok let me let me give you what it is so there is this winged edge data structure here what we have is uh, basically the the core data structure is considered as edge right so there is this information about let's say an edge a so it gives you the vertices which are there for the edge a right the constituent vertices x y the faces which are shared by this edge right 1 and 2 and there is also this notion that how are you going to traverse the, the mesh right. So, you have uh, if you look at from the left side right with respect to the polygon 1 you have this clockwise navigation and if you look at from the right again you have clockwise navigation ok. So, you also have the information that if I am doing the left traversal right on this side then what is the predecessor to this edge and what is the successor to this edge right. So, B and D and also in the same way when I am doing a right traversal right what is the predecessor and what is the successor right. So, I have this information in the data structure ok. So, now if I am interested in finding out the incident edges for a point let us say x then I can do that with the limited limited navigation about a certain number of polygons right. See this would tell me what what are the possible edges I need to look for and what are the polygons shared by those edges right. So, I do not have to traverse the entire edge list. right so if you look at the way it is sort of drawn pictorially so you see this edge which is here the principal entity for the data structure a the edge a and this there is this phase 1 on the left side there is a phase 2 on the right side and then you have these edges b c d e so they sort of form a wing about this edge right. So, this is let us say the central part of a bird and these are just the wings. So, that is why it is called winged edge data structure ok. So, well this is all right as long as we do not consider holes. The moment we consider holes well we may have to do something else. Fine. So, uh, let us stop here, we will continue from here next time and I will also discuss the second assignment. Thank you.